Let's have prayer. Let's have prayer. Father, thank you so much for bringing us together today. We thank you for the time and the opportunity always to come into your presence. We thank you for calling us into your presence. We thank you for your presence. And we ask that the presence lift our study off the page today. Write it upon our hearts. Help us put one foot in front of the other in this life under the sun. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. David Nelson, a wide receiver for the New York Jets, was in Haiti in 2012 volunteering after the earthquake. He found a small malnourished boy trapped in some rebar. He freed him and offered him food, water, candy, games, and he refused them all. So he asked what he wanted, and the boy held out his hands and in perfect English said, hold me. And he did. Said it was the best five minutes of his life because he realized at that moment that he lived only for vanity. His words. It's what caught my attention about this because he actually used the word vanity. He and his brother then rented a three-bedroom house in Port-au-Prince and received a phone call last June. An orphanage that was, only open, that was only open to bilk American relief money out of organizations had nine kids near death, infants to six years old. With the orphanage owners threatening them with guns, they took the kids away. Now, two brothers, both single, are raising nine Haitian orphans who they are in the process of adopting. He tells you his body lives in a condo in New Jersey and does amazing things on a football field, but his heart is in a three-bedroom house in Port-au-Prince in the Western Hemisphere's poorest nation. When compassion is allowed to rule under the sun, it gets our attention, doesn't it? Immediately gets our attention. I hear stories like this, and I get feelings. Feelings I wish I didn't have. One is jealousy. You know, I wish I could do that. You know, or I wish I had done that with what I have. Okay? Um, sometimes uh, the under the sun has me so um, jaded, if you will, or so hardened I think, well, if I made an NFL salary, I'd do that too. You know? But what have I done with mine? What have I done with mine? And so I love to see compassion do something under the sun because I really believe that true compassion is the only thing that does anything, that accomplishes anything under the sun. Solomon wanted to accomplish something under the sun, and he put everything to use that he had. And when he did, what did he find out? What, was, what did we conclude on Sabbath? It's all hopeless. Okay? Nothing can be done here. Okay? There's, something, there's something amiss. More than amiss, there's absolutely nothing that can be done. We may find the one thing today that can do something about living under the sun. Okay? It's what disturbs him most in his um, examination of under the sun and reporting it to us is that there doesn't seem to be any compassion. This verse right here is what got me. This will be our, our linchpin verse today. Again, I saw all the, what? The oppressions that are practiced under the sun. Look, the tears of the oppressed with no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors, there was power with no one to comfort them. It's an interesting juxtaposition that he uses. The words that he chooses in his poetry are very telling. What does he want you to get? Uh, professors in public speech tell you that if you want to get somebody's attention and emphasize a point, one very effective way to do that is what they call floating opposites. You have a word concluding in one sentence, and then you use the opposite to conclude the next one. So in this one, you see what we have, right? Oppressions, oppressed, oppressors. He uses that word three times. This is what bothers him the most. It's an overwhelming problem that seriously disturbs the Kohelis today. And that's why he chooses the words that he used. He accepts that oppression is inherent under the sun. Have you thought about it? If you were to ask, if I were to ask one, give me one word description of this life under the sun, especially looking at it the way that our Kohelis does, oppression would be a pretty good one, wouldn't it? Oppression would be a pretty good one. 
And this is what Solomon is finding in there. So he uses it three times. Oppression, oppressed, oppressor. We'll get to the floating opposites a little later, but what is it? It's comfort. Oppression, no one to comfort. Oppression, comfort. You know, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but that's his floating opposites. In the poetry, it gets your attention, doesn't it? It really gets your attention. So he accepts this. And I believe, I told you a couple of times now, that he just might be realizing his part in this oppression as he looks back on his life and as he looks back on his reign. Was he an oppressor? Yes, he was. Just like he had been warned. He will take one-tenth of your flocks, and you shall be his slaves. This is what Samuel told Israel. This is why you don't want a king. Not only will he take your children to serve in his armies and serve in his palace and cultivate his food and everything else, but he'll also take your what? Did you realize you were going to have to double tithe Israel when you had a king? I don't think he's taking your first tithe. He's asking for a second one. And the king doesn't have to ask, does he? He doesn't have to ask. So I understand. I've had people actually come to me and say, Greg, give Solomon a break. He wouldn't enslave Israelites. No, not for labor, okay? Not for labor, but with what? With taxes, okay? It must have been. He must have been because when he died and his son is ready to take reign, what does the report that his friends give back on what kind of ruler he should be? Remember, the old wise me, uh, men come to his son and say, you know, your father was real hard on us. If you would lighten up just a little bit, this is what he said. Your father made our yoke what? Heavy. So maybe he didn't enslave Israelites, although he sla enslaved millions of others. At least when it came to Israelites, how did he oppress them? With taxes. In fact, he's charging a tithe of everyone in Israel in taxes. Where do you think it's going? Is it going to roads and schools and sewers? No. It's going to the palace. Like I said uh, yesterday, I, I, I thought it was so forward for, of him to appoint 12 governors for all Israel. He, he appoints a governor per tribe. I thought that was uh, per region. I thought, wow, a man who wants to be in touch with the heart of his people. He's, he's using a representative for, for form of government. And then it concludes saying they were in charge of procuring food for the palace. That's the all, jo the all job that the governor had. Food for the palace. So your father made the yoke. You see, the problem with a monarchy, and here in lies the fundamental problem with an earthly king and why God didn't want one, is if you think about it, some sort of oppression is a must. In order for a king to sit on a throne, he's had to have oppressed somebody. You get me? He's had to have oppressed somebody. Oppression has to exist for a king to continue on a throne because all the power under the sun lies with those who are able to oppress. Correct? The power in people to oppress. Now, some people don't use that power in order to do so. I wish there were a bigger percentage. But some people don't use that power. But if you think about it, in order for a king to sit on a throne and exercise that kind of power, oppression is a must. Somebody's being oppressed when there's a king. I think this was God's problem with it. Please, Israel, don't ask for a king. Because this is what's going to happen. And it happened with the worst, the first one, okay? And it happens with the best. I think that's what the Bible's trying to get across to us, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. What he's trying to get across is Solomon was the best, was the best that a human king offered. And here he's writing his memoirs and his Ecclesiastes, 
uh, the words of the Koheleth, the memoirs, is he's looking back on his reign and says, I was one of the worst. I could only do what already had been done. So that's what happens. The only thing under the sun that you can do about oppression, he said, in that, in going back to that verse, is we have to have people to what? We have to have people to comfort them. We looked at that on Sabbath. He's explored all kinds of ways to try to comfort the people. It seems that the very first thing he did was survey his kingdom, look at the people who were being oppressed under the sun, and then he went to explore how he could alleviate their, their oppression. He even explored getting them drunk. By the way, there's a proverb <laughs> that actually says, if they're going to be poor, you might as well give them wine. He still thinks that's a viable alternative. And this is what is bothering the most. Oppression is happening. I'm one of the oppressors. And there's no one to what? No one to comfort us. That's what's bothering the most about what it is to live under the sun. The repetition of they have no comforter. They have no comforter. He accepts the inevitability and unavoidability, if that's a word, but my name is Webster. I can make up words. <laughs> I've just, you know, it's, it's on page something of my dictionary. I, you know, but anyway, I think it's inevitability and unavoidable should have been an adjective. But the inevitability and how unavoidable oppression is under the sun. But what bothers him the most is that no one seems to what? No one seems to care. Okay? There's no one to comfort them. Israel demanded a king. Why? In how? Okay? How, how would it make him like all the other nations? Hmm? In a way, but you have to remember at the time that they, that they are demanding a king, as the time of the judges comes to an end, are they a nation at peace with the nations around them? They're constantly at war, aren't they? Okay. Now, if <laughs> we talked yesterday about, about, about being a pessimist, okay, uh, if you, if you want to know how cynical I really am about Israel at this particular time, the thing about Israel is that they're a brand new nation, okay, brand new. And the time of the judges was supposed to be God trying to show them that they didn't need a king. So the punishment for going off the rails and worshiping other gods was that God was using the nations around them to try to keep them in check, right? As long as they, as long as they walked with the Lord, everything was cool. The judge would have them walk in the way of the Lord, would show them the way to walk in the way of the Lord, and they'd be at peace with everyone. When they went off the rails, what would happen? Philistines would what? Philistines would come in and rout them, right? So they're not a nation at peace. What they want a king for is to be able to do to them what has been done to them, is to be able to do to the other nations what has been done to them. What they have noticed is that every time one of those nations comes in and defeats us in war, they've got something we don't. They have a what? They have a king. It says, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, we are determined to have a king over us so that we may also be like other nations, that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. So what's Israel's solution to their oppression? To be able to oppress. And herein lies the problem under the sun. Under the sun's rule number one is that oppression is fought with better oppression, stronger oppression, more oppression. Those kings wanted to, the, the, the nation wanted the king on their throne simply so he could defeat their enemies. And when you look at people being oppressed all throughout history, when you look at people being oppressed now, what's their first instinct to go look for? There's a way to oppress people back. Violence begets violence. Have you ever thought about it that we were told that if we're hit on the left cheek, 
We're supposed to what? Turn the other. Why? You hit me first. I probably deserve it. Okay. But you, you hit me. All right. My gut reaction is not to turn the other cheek. It's to what? Hit you back. Okay. You're going to hit me again, but it probably isn't the reason for the first time you hit me. Now it's why? Because I hit you. Right? Turn the other cheek at least stops the cycle. And it may stop the cycle long enough for something to happen. It may not. Ask any martyr whether or not it stops the cycle. But it stops the cycle with them. Dr. King and Gandhi adopted these methods because they knew they needed to stop the cycle because the violence had gotten to the point to where it was oppression versus oppression. It was violence begets violence, and the principle was completely lost. Nobody knew why they were hitting each other anymore. Dr. King went one step further. He said, I don't want the violence just to stop. I want my oppressor to recognize his humanity. I want him to find his humanity again. And the only way to do that is that if I quit giving him reason to hit me back. Unfortunately, many people will have to lose their lives in order for that to begin to happen. But I will tell you, if you ever believed, if you ever not believed that pacifism can work under the sun, I will tell you that you and I lived through the two greatest examples of, of that in human history as far as I'm concerned. Gandhi in India and the civil rights movement in the United States in the 60s. Anyway, they have no comforter. They wanted a king because they wanted to oppress just like the other nations that were oppressing them. Okay? So, it, it, so the, the problem with the king, though, is that he comes and not only does he oppress the other nations, he has to oppress who? He has to oppress his own people in order to be on the throne. God had in mind that he wanted Israel to have him as their ruler. This is the whole point of a theocracy. We look and we say that Israel was a theocracy. I don't believe Israel ever was a theocracy at any time in their history. As a nation, the only time that they came close to, to being a theocracy was in the wilderness. And they weren't a nation yet. Some may argue under the sun that the only time that that's going to work is if somebody doesn't, uh, if, if they are wanderers, okay? If they're aliens, if they are without country. Because once they got to be a nation, they had borders to protect now. They had resources to fight over. <laughs> Let me ask you, in, in talking about the character of God, if you will, why is it you believe that he gave land that already belonged to somebody else to Israel. See, most of us, I'll speak for you, okay? Most of us think it's because those people were really bad people, right? They were pagans. They practiced fertility rites. They sacrificed their own children. Yes, horrible, absolutely horrible, okay? Absolutely horrible. But the people that he replaced them with ended up adopting those rites anyway, didn't they? What he wanted to show them, I believe, is that somebody already is there all the time. And the only way under the sun for you to be able to get that is you're going to have to kill somebody for it. I think he wanted Israel to recognize, hey, don't you think maybe he wanted somebody just to stand up once and say, hey, this is wrong. Let's figure out another way to do this. The one time, the, the, the certain times, I, you know, David's called the apple of God's eye because David carries this impossible burden of being a king. And I, most, most people believe, most Christians believe that he is the apple of his eye because he was the most mighty warrior, you know, he killed 10,000s and all of that. But that's not what impresses God about David. I think it's when David defies expectations of a human king. Remember I said, first thing a king does when he takes the throne, what's the very first thing he does? He has to eliminate his rivals. He has to eliminate anybody that has claim to the throne. What does David do with the house of Saul? 
Is there anybody from the house of Saul that I may show compassion? To me, this is what makes David different. Because David is giving hints of the eternal son of David that will one day sit on that throne. Because if Jesus were ruling Israel, that's exactly what he would do. Amen? I think this is why he is. Anyway, what would it look like if God were truly their ruler? You don't have to guess. He told us. He told Moses to tell him. Here was the law living in the theocracy of Israel. You shall not deprive a resident alien or an orphan of justice. You shall not take a widow's garment in pledge. The two most vulnerable people on the planet right there. He's saying the two most vulnerable people on the planet. The people that will always be oppressed the most. The alien and the what? And the orphan and the widow. Always. And what does he say? How you will treat them in my nation if I'm your king. You won't treat them the way others will. You will not deprive a resident alien or an orphan of of justice. You shall not take a widow's garment and pledge. Remember why. You're supposed to remember something. And what do we remember? That we were what? That we were slaves in Egypt. And the Lord, your God, redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this. If you want to know what it was like to have God as your ruler, here's number one. The people that the world oppresses will not be oppressed in Israel. They will not be oppressed. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, don't go back to get it. It's left for who? It's left for the alien. You shall not go back to get it. It shall be left for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. A, a, a Jewish scholar that I really admire says that we get all warm and fuzzy with the romance of Ruth and Boaz's story, right? He doesn't because he knows that Boaz was commanded to do that right there. Boaz was following the law. And he goes, okay, okay, I can see. He may have given her a little more than he was supposed to, but it's what he was commanded to do. And I'll tell you, even in the midst of the story of Ruth, Ruth and Boaz, you find, you find also why the letter of the law doesn't cut it. Okay? There's a line in there where he tells the, his workers, this girl right here, okay, don't make her pick the leftovers. In fact, I want you to go bind some good stuff, bring whole ones and take it to her. And then there's a, a, the next line that he says, and see to it that no, no, none of the men harass her. What do you think the men were doing in order to give these widows, to get the, in order for the widows to get there? What do you think they were doing? So right in the middle of that story, you see the difference, the problem with just the letter of the law. When you beat your olive trees, don't what? Don't strip what is left. I had an olive tree in our house in Phoenix when we lived here oh so many years ago. Everybody smiles at me like that. I hated it. I hated that thing. Okay, Because I thought that olives off the tree, that that's what they tasted like. I thought, and the first time I tried to eat one, ah, you mean I can't eat these? And I had no idea what the process is to be able to, to I just knew I probably couldn't do it in my kitchen or my bathtub. Okay. <laughs> Marilyn could, (laughs) but you weren't anywhere near my neighborhood. And guess what? It's heavy enough that a mower won't pick them up. So it was nothing but junk, nothing but olives, nothing but trash all around that olive tree. I hated that thing, okay? But also knew that at a certain time of the year, if you gave it a good whack with the baseball bat, all of the olives would fall off. But no, not all of them will, only about half. Imagine that. Imagine you own an olive grove. And he's telling you, you only get to shake it, what? Once. And some trees will have almost half of it on there, and he's saying, I want you to walk away right now. What would you be doing as as the owner? (laughs) Who am I supposed to leave that for? Who is it for? 
the alien, the orphan, the widow. I'll tell you what was one of the things in the theology of the uh, sanctuary cities, the, uh, the cities of refuge back then. The roads all went by the edges of every field in all of Israel. The road from, from the city of refuge, from wherever it, in order to get to the city of refuge, every road had at least a decent long stretch of, of, of vineyards and, and fields and everything else. Because what were you supposed to do with the outside? You weren't allowed to harvest the outside. Who was it for? For the resident alien. And is there anybody more in need of food than somebody who's on the run for their very lives? Somebody who's killed somebody and needs, needs to get somewhere bef- uh, so he can explain his case. So what's it look like when God's in charge? What's it look like when he truly is king? When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, don't glean what is left. It'll be left for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. Remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I'm commanding you to what? To do this. Even the people that almost ask to be oppressed under the sun, the people that have absolutely no power, it's almost like they're asking the evil power of under the sun to oppress me. God said, not so. Not so with me as king. There will be no oppression. Even when the, oppress, when the oppressing is, even when everyone else is doing it, or maybe especially when everyone else is doing it. Not in Israel, because we're supposed to care for who? We're supposed to care for each other. They would care for the weak, because they were all to remember that they were once what? Slaves. Remember I told you that my friend, pa- uh, my, my friend uh, pointed out that one of the things in the, the time, there is time for everything passages, okay, that the wealth and everything of Solomon's kingdom, the wealth and the power of Sol- Solomon's kingdom had grown so much that Israel kind of lives vicariously through him, you know, they, they, they kind of look and say, that's ours. They may be poor, and he's taxing them to death, but, but, but they're proud because he's our guy. You know, and they kind of live vicariously. Here's the problem again with the monarchy. Here's the problem with the monarchy, at least in Israel, is that they could be proud of David and Solomon, but they were also saying, let the king do something about this. They look at the poverty and the oppression around them, and they say, the king is the one that can do something about this. He's the only one that can do something about this. So what they end up doing is they end up withholding the comfort that they could be giving, waiting for Solomon to do something. Let him do something about the weak and the widow and the orphan. All because they forgot they were what? They forgot they were slaves. Generations away, from being oppressed themselves, the nation enjoys its greatest wealth in Solomon's reign, and they've forgotten. Why? Because living under the sun leads you to a particular state of mind. They simply do not care. It's where oppression comes from. It is the ideal form of getting by under the sun. Satan doesn't have to look very hard to be able to put this particular key in this particular lock. Because in the human nature, that is the biggest, most inviting lock there is. Our selfishness, that is now our nature, and just a little bit of fear, okay? A little bit of fear, a little bit of of, uh, of pride, Name them all. Just name all seven. <laughs> you know, And that key just fits right in there. And as soon as he unlocks that, someone's going to get oppressed. They've forgotten they were slaves. Oppressions abound, the Kohelis says. Physical, spiritual applications here abound, don't they? Have you been getting spiritual applications from these physical examples? Is there such a thing as religious oppression? Sure there is. Sure there is. If we have time, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what Jesus taught us about it, if we, if we get time. But one thing, if we all remembered where we came from, 
maybe that would do something about it. If we all remember where we came from. If, if, if we were reminded every day what has been done for us, would it make it easier or more difficult to oppress when, it, when we are then presented with the opportunity? If we, were, if we were just reminded of what has been done for us, right? Because then even the Kohelis says something can happen. Because he says this in the, next, in the next verses. Two are better than what? Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. If they fall, one will lift up the other. But woe to the one who is what? Alone and falls and does not have another to help. I know. I use this passage every time I marry somebody. But this isn't a wedding passage. This isn't about marriage. Yes, hopefully a husband and wife find this, don't you? I hope they find this, all right? But he's also talking about everyone else. None of us were meant to be alone. Some of us, and, and, and no, not every one of us were meant to marry. But he said, if you're not married, you should find this somewhere. All of us should have a friend like this somewhere. All of us should have a church. But it's speaking of religious oppression, is it necessarily so that you're going to find somebody like this just because you walk into a church? Exactly. Exactly. I really hope we get to the religious oppression part. Like I said, I love this passage for weddings. But there's also people out there heartbroken because they're either not married anymore, they've lost somebody, or they're single because God has called them to be. By the way, another form of oppression. I've been in churches where it's been preached and been taught and the climate is, it's God's will for you to be married. Really? Okay. <laughs> this is for humanity. This is for the curing of oppression under the sun. Husbands, wives, friends, brothers, sisters, somebody. Somebody to lift me up when I fall. It's what he's looking for. If two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm what? Alone. And though one might prevail against another, two will withstand one. A threefold cord is not easily broken. He said it's good for you to have two friends, but now he's working his way up to a small group. Everybody should have a small group. Right? So anyway, mutual caring is the only solution to oppression. The oppressed, oppression, and oppressors under the sun leaves the Kohelet with one conclusion. And this is shocking, actually. It's absolutely shocking. The three uh, times that he uses oppress, oppression and, uh, and, and oppressors, he's saying that I conclude this, that until comfort begins to reign, until compassion begins to, 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 to be the yeast that it's supposed to be, he said, here's my conclusion. I thought the dead have already died more fortunate than the living who are still alive. Better than both is the one who has not yet been and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. Oh, my goodness. Ouch. Here's a man who has explored the and looked for the best of humanity in its deepest, darkest boundaries. And he's come back from the journey to say, guess what? We're all better off what? We're all better off dead. Yesterday he told us, right? We're no better than the animals sometimes. If you're going to treat each other like animals, guess what? We all die like animals too. Death is better than life. In fact, it's better not to be what? Job, the first thing he asks after everything happens to him, the very first thing he asks is, why was I ever what? Why was I ever born? Okay. Now, I know in chapter 9, verse 4, he'll say it's better to be a living dog than a dead lion. <laughs> but the verse also says, whoever is joined with all living has hope. 
The hope has to be there. He's got to find somebody. He's got to find a reason not to conclude to this. I'm looking for a reason in all humanity to not have to come to this conclusion. And I cannot find one because there are no comforters. Being alone, if you think about it. Not just being alone, not being lonely. It's not a sin to be lonely. I think it's a sin to be alone. If it's intentional. And for the people that are constantly being oppressed, they're alone. But being alone, living for self, along with human nature, the ingredients that only end in, in oppression, something has to happen in order to come in to break that cycle. Having no cause outside oneself makes anyone an oppressor. And there's no better cause than that one person that you're with to help stand up when they fall, right? Our whole cause may be just one person. Our entire cause might just be one person. Because again, I saw that what? Vanity under the sun. The case of solitary individuals without sons or brothers, yet there is no end to all their toil, and their eyes are never satisfied with riches. With riches. For who I am toiling, they ask, and depriving myself of pleasure. This also is vanity and an unhappy what? And an unhappy business. He probes deeper to the depths of human motivation, and he finds absolutely no redemption under the sun. He asks all of us, every one of us today, why do you work so hard? Why are you overworking yourself? Why do you want to spend your life that way? And even the best answer, the most selfless answer that we can come up with, saying, well, I'm trying, I'm trying to provide for my family. I'm trying to contribute to society, enjoy work more than anything else, and so on and so on. The Kohelet violently disagrees with us, claiming that the basic motivation for our striving is rivalry. He says, no, you don't. You're not doing this for your family. You're being driven by rivalry. We all have that in some respect, don't we? There is a time, there's a time when we look, like Pastor Manning said yesterday, there is a time when we look and say, why is that guy better than I am? Why is he doing better than I am? He's never walked into a church before. He's never paid me tithes. Unfortunately, that can crush people if we don't get a hold of it. It's not just in our charity. When we hear a story of, like I told in the beginning, of David Nelson, what he could do for those children, wasn't there just, I told you before, wasn't there just a little bit of envy in there? And I have to tell you, I'm confessing to you that when I saw it, that's what I said in the back of my head, too, was, hey, if I made an NFL receiver salary, I'd do it, too. But in my salary that comes nowhere close to an NFL receiver, I haven't done anything in proportion to what he's been doing. So then we begin doing exactly what we're not supposed to do. Then we begin questioning people's motives. And, we, and the second we begin to question people's motives, the second I look at a guy like David Nelson and say, the only reason you're doing that is because you make enough money to do that, I then stand with the accuser because that is the only thing Satan does is stand around and wait for somebody to do something and then question their motives or get somebody else to question their motives. Does Job serve God for nothing? The first thing he did to attack Job was to question his motives. When the only one who knows moti motives is who? God. That's what makes him the, the accuser. That's his name, Ha-Satan. Satan means accuser in Hebrew. It's not a formal name. I never capitalize it in my notes. That's just my thing. I don't capitalize Satan when I write, write it in my notes. We will tell you, though, Microsoft Word autocorrects it and capitalizes it. <laughs> just saying, just saying. <laughs> yeah. 
I look at problems in the world and I don't have to jump too far till I run into Microsoft. I'm just, you know, I just, you know. Or maybe I want ESPN to do a film on me. That's why I might question his motives. Then I saw that all toil and all skill and work come from one person's what? Envy of another. He's getting to the heart of the matter, isn't he? This is also vanity and a chasing after the wind. Fools fold their hands and consume their own flesh. Better is a handful with quiet than two handfuls with toil and a chasing what? After the wind. Better is, better is a poor but wise youth than an old but foolish king who will no longer take advice. One can indeed come out of prison to reign, even though born poor in the kingdom. I saw all the living who, moving about under the sun, follow that youth who replaced the king. There was no end to all those people whom he led. Yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is a vanity and chasing after the wind. The mess that we are going to read for the next 60, 70, 80 chapters after Solomon dies, he says, no, <laughs> there's got to be something better than this. He just predicted it right there. So the Koheleth, the teacher, is a king, and he's also a poet, and he's also a what? He's also a prophet. So herein lies our problem. And we find it everywhere, don't we? How do we know that we're in the end time? I bet if I asked, we could come up with 10 signs, can't we? Matthew 24, Revelation 13, right? Revelation 2, Revelation 3. We all know them, don't we? Matthew 24 is my favorite because it's more concise. And it lists them, you know, in an order that we can memorize, right? Wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, disease, drought, earthquakes, dark sun, blood moon, right? Just name and name and name it. Did you know in Matthew 24, he says the ultimate sign, though, that you're living in the end time was what? And because of the increase of lawlessness, the love of many will what? Lack of compassion. Apathy. That's the biggest sign of the end time. Why? Tells us right there. The increase of what? Lawlessness. Now I understand. I understand that the people of God have the testimony of Jesus and keep the commandments of God. Okay? I understand that sin is transgression of the law. I understand that sin is lawlessness. But remember what the teacher taught us. What is the law? How is the law fulfilled? Love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. So because of the increase of the love of, uh, decrease of the love of God, the decrease of the love of neighbor of yourself, then the whole world grows apathetic. By the way, the world misses that one part. The world would like to love their neighbor as their self. They just don't believe in the loving God part. Who are the people that's supposed to be telling them that the key to loving your neighbor as yourself is to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul? The reason that the earth comes off its axis, that this is the final sign, is because we lost our compassion. Now we go back to last year, and remember? The seven churches is just this sad story of how it works, of how it operates all throughout history. Remember the first thing that we learned is that the church degrades all throughout history to where there's only one thing wrong with it all the way down to where there is everything wrong with it and Jesus can say nothing good about it. And I agree at a point with the standard view of what the first love lost was. I understand the first love, the first zeal when you come to love Christ. But I have to conclude another reason. That the first love isn't that we love Christ. The first love is that Jesus loved us. I believe that's what the church lost at Ephesus. They be still tried to be a church when they forgot that God loves them. For some reason, it got in their head. It got in their head that the reason maybe everything is not working out is we have a little heresy here. We have a little heresy there. We need to cleanse. We need to purify. Jesus commends them for that work. But I have this against you. You forgot that God loves you. 
You're looking over your shoulder thinking, yeah, I can make God love me if I purify my church. I can make God love me if I become completely pure. That's when they lost their first love. And when the church forgets that God loves them, if Solomon forgets that God loves him, it has driven him to this point. Solomon doesn't believe he can be saved. He says, I don't believe I can be saved. I know what I've done, but I'm taking it to God. And maybe he just doesn't realize that confessing those things before God is what will save us. This is the last time. I don't know how old the man was. He'd been there for years. He had never seen the light of day. He was born blind in John chapter 9. We need him because Jesus and his disciples happened to come upon him. Now, you have to understand that Jesus' disciples picture themselves rightly, and I think that they should, as a rabbinic school. In fact, I think that that's what maybe John and James and Peter loved the most and Andrew loved the most is because they were fishermen's sons. They were never going to be in a rabbinic school. And here this rabbi called us. It's not one of the famous schools. It's not Hillel. It's not Shammai. It's not the ones that everybody knows. Didn't have a building. Rabbi certainly wasn't credentialed. He was from Galilee, did I tell you? But they were rabbinic students. And all I know about this man was that he was born blind. But the next thing I know about him is what he's been used for his whole life. Because even this little humble, what should be completely humble rabbinic school, only 12 members, no building, no sponsors, nothing fancy, just this, just this Galilean rabbi who shouldn't be a rabbi at all, according to the elite rabbinic students. They encounter this man, and they immediately turn to the teacher, and they say, Rabbi, who sinned that this man was born blind? See, they're making a statement. And the statement is, since he was born blind, God did this. And if God did this to you, man, I don't know what you did. Or I don't know what you were going to do. I don't know what your parents did. But for this to happen to you, he certainly is not thrilled with you. And so these country rabbinic students and this country rabbi do exactly to what this man, what I believe then, everyone else has done his entire life. They've used him as a religious prop. They've used him to look good. See, uh, 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 a Pharisee, a chief priest, a scribe, their, their righteousness is involved in being good. It, it is all completely wrapped up in that. If, if I look good, there's nothing you can say to me. If I keep my commandments, there's nothing you can say to me. I know that I'm spiritual. The thing about a Pharisee is he's always looking for somebody who seems to be worse off than he is because then he can feel good about himself. See, because if you're going to rely on your self-righteousness, you're going to need every tool in the arsenal to keep you righteous. And they've deluded themselves to the point that God actually likes them better than he likes this guy. You're going to be my bond, my bread. I thank you, O oh Lord. I'm not like that blind man over there. See, the tax collector's sin came after he was born. The tax collector had everything. He had his eyes, he had his ears, he had everything. So, so that, was, that was even more vile. But this, this is the vilest of vile because God did this to you. What the heck did you do? So they use him as a prop. The rabbinic schools stand around him and debate the theology of blindness, the theology of sin. And all the while thanking God that I'm not like this blind man here. And after they were done using him, 
to walk away. Back to school. Back to being good. Back to being elders and deacons. Back to being the church. So even these simple country rabbinic students do the same thing when they encounter him. As far as I know, they've never met him before in his life. But they see an opportunity. See an opportunity to look to him. Then the rabbi speaks. And the man hears a voice he's never, ever heard before. And he hears something said about him and his mom and dad that he's never, ever heard before. Neither. Neither has sinned. He was born blind for what? To sin. This sin. He was born blind so I could come along and do what I'm about to do and teach everybody a hard lesson. We know what he did, right? Reaches down, he picks up some dirt, he spits in it, rubs it in his hand, and then he rubs it on the man's eye. And then he steps back, steps back, takes his hands off him, and only speaks words. The power in Jesus' healing in this particular case is in his word. He only speaks the word. Go to Siloam and walk. It's an interesting journey. Siloam, from where they're standing, is about a thousand yards that way. So it's not a, it's not a, you know, a, it's not right there. So he's, he's, he's walking with the mud on his eyes. He's walking and he's going to Siloam. I don't know if anybody's leading him. Probably not. Because the one thing the, rab- the rabbinic schools didn't do, they would debate about him. They would, they would, they would talk about his family. They would, di- they would discuss the theology of his blindness. They would discuss the theology of why God finds you so vile. But nobody ever did anything for him. So I think he walks alone. Maybe he was healed just a little bit, but maybe some light would shine in. Maybe, maybe Jesus only put a, a pinpoint of light that all he had to do was follow that pinpoint and it would take him right to the pool of Siloam. But of course, he washes in Siloam and what happens? Jesus is nowhere near him when it happened. Jesus just spoke the word. Then, of course, the tables are completely turned because this sinner, born sinner, <laughs> this sinner who, who has to be so vile and hated by God comes back and, and debates them and puts them completely on their, on their backside. In fact, he frustrates them so much that they now even deny what was done for him and they say, you were born entirely in your sin. See, their theology holds. Even though he now is no longer blind, their theology holds, doesn't it? You were born entirely entirely in your sin. And and John says, and they cast him out. He thought he made it. He thought he could go to synagogue. In fact, I think that's where he was headed. He has not been allowed in synagogue his entire life. We can't have somebody that God hates as much as you uh, messing up our synagogue, defiling our synagogue with your sin, whatever it is. Right? He thought he was going to get to go. I think he was getting the last bit of mud off to go straight to synagogue. And it says they had driven him out. And guess what? As soon as somebody hears that he was driven out, guess what? Now Jesus comes back. As soon as he heard he was driven out, now he comes back. And he just asked him one question. Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he says, show me who he is so that I can what? So that I can worship him. And it's a beautiful thing that Jesus says. He says, the voice you hear, the one that you heard a little while ago, the voice you hear, I'm the one, the one who stands before you. And now you actually see me. Now you can put a face with the voice. And as soon as it happens, it says that the man worshipped him. Now, remember what you had to do in order to worship in the first century. What did you have to do? Fall down on your face. Fall down on your face. So 
So the next time you read John 10, and it starts with the words, I am the good shepherd, remember there's an entire, entire church of no comforting, compassionless, religious oppressors listening. And there's one lamb laying at his feet the whole time. Because it doesn't say that they went anywhere else. John doesn't break the narrative. When he launches into John chapter 10 and starts the theology of the good shepherd, there's no break in it. That man's still laying there. I'm the good shepherd. And remember, it's beautiful discourse. I'm, a, I'm the good shepherd. And here's how you know who, how I, how, here's, here's two things, if you will, going all the way through the chapter. Here's two things that you know about the good shepherd. What makes him a good shepherd is my sheep hear my voice. And that's what he did. He let him hear his voice. And then he showed him his face with the voice. My sheep hear my voice. And I'm willing to lay down my life for the sheep. The hired hand, the second trouble hit, they're gone. The hired hand, use my sheep for their own purposes. Speaking to an entire generation of good, upright, rabbinic students and rabbis and chief priests and scribes who use this man for a religious prop, who use this man to look good every time they stood beside him. I thank you, O oh Lord, I'm not like this blind man here. I thank you that you love me and not him. He's telling the disciples, this is what makes us good shepherds is that we're willing not to do this. We're willing not to be just hired hands. We're willing not to use the sheep for our own purpose, not to use a sinner just so we can look good. And why am I never ever to use a sinner for that purpose? Because I'm not supposed to forget that I was once a slave in Egypt. And I'm not supposed to forget I'm a sinner enslaved to the sin. That I'm a sheep. And without my shepherd, I am lost. The words of the Kohelet, to me, they're completely, absolutely bathed and echoed and fulfilled in the words of the ultimate Kohelet, the teacher that 12 men called teacher about a thousand years later. So if you don't think that religious, religious people can oppress, guess what? Sometimes we're the worst. With the very people that we're supposed to be reaching with the love of God. This is why Solomon looks and says, you know what? Unless some compassion, unless some comforters come along somewhere, whew, we're just better off dead. On the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. But the good shepherd doesn't want that end for us. And he died to make sure. He died to make sure that we knew that. He died to make sure that we could hear his voice. And what happens when a sheep hears the shepherd's voice? They follow him. In word and in deed and in compassion and in everything else. Amen? Let it be noted I ended on time today. I went late yesterday. I'm supposed to be back at 1045 with Manny. It was close. I mean with Gary. I'm sorry. With Gary. Gary's today. Manny was yesterday. Gary is going to start a series of morons. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for bringing us together. I thank you for, again, the time and the opportunity to come into your presence. I just ask, Lord, that, again, you remove the words from the paper, write it upon our hearts, bathe it in the love that you have called us to be. I stumble, and we all do, Lord. We just need you to literally put one foot in front of the other for us. Help us to remember that you do love us. Help us to remember that that is our first love. And help us to lovingly put our hands in yours, that our hands would do what you would do, and that our feet would do what you would do, and that we would simply walk and talk with you, celebrate you in our lives. 
and go about doing something about this life under the sun. Keep this family safe from harm and from temptation. Bring us back together again to live in your word. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all very much.